In the heart-pounding world of horse racing, where speed and strategy intertwine, there exists a legend, a man whose passion for these magnificent creatures has shaped generations. Meet Howard Hamilton, a titan in the realm of equine excellence. For decades, his name has been synonymous with ownership, breeding, and the intricate dance of horse racing administration. Join Quick Gallop, jhay.com, and its YouTube channel, The Quick Galloper, as we embark on an extraordinary journey through the life and legacy of this extraordinary man. Uh, Howard Hamilton, you have been around racing for such a long time. Mm -hmm. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> Let me start here at the beginning. Okay. My father got me involved in racing when I was about 11 years old. He used to take me with him to race in Nutsford Park and a little Marley in, in, in Old Harbour. Mm -hmm. And that got me involved. When I went with Nutsford, to Nutsford Park with him, he used to dress up in his jacket and tie and start with the high palloy. I had to sit down with the grooms and the jockeys. So I learned a lot about the the intricacies and the, the hard part of racing from those who were the real involvers, the jockeys, the grooms and the trainers. Following from that, I was very friendly with the late Bobby Hale, who went to Woolmers with me, and he got me involved in buying my first race house back in 1973 from Charlie Brown, a house called Caroline. Mr. Epton, CC to line, I never got that house. He ran 18 times and finished last 17 times. <laughs> he was trained by Wallace Nickel. You remember, he was apprenticed to, to Sidney Watson from Pat Strong's table. And from there on, I got involved with Dickie Jackson at Bowden Estate, and I bought some horses from him, Moselle, and a number of other horses from him. And Moselle was one of the hard, really interesting horses I owned. His front legs were a bit shorter than his back legs. But Moselle really gave me a lot of pleasure. From there I bought other horses, El Cordilla, Beaujolais, and I used to name all my horses after wines. So you remember Mont Dior, Valny, and a whole range of other horses. Mm -hmm. But, so you're a Kingstonian? Yes. You're, you're born and bred in Kingston. We were born King in St. Mary, Lucky Hill, and moved to Kingston when I was about 10 years old. Moved to Port Antonio first when I was about 10 years old. Luckily, I won a scholarship to go to Woolmers, one of the six government scholarships offered then. At Woolmers, that's where I met Bobby Hale. And he was a 440 runner, and he used to be exercising every day at the race at the, at the sports field in Woolmers. Woolmers. Woolmers was the foundation of all my education, and I owe so much to them. So much so that all my racing colours are maroon and gold, in memory of the beautiful days I spent at Woolmers, and how much I earned, learned from them. Okay, so you went to Woolmers, you got into racing. Tell me about your corporate life because you have held some major positions over, yeah. over the years. Well, I was lucky to win a Shell scholarship to go to the University of West Indies after I graduated from Woolmers. The most satisfying job I had then was when I left Woolmers. I taught for two terms at Arden High School, which is a co-ed school. Most of the girls there were older than me and they all used to phone me the nice about homework. And I knew it wasn't homework, they were really interesting. <laughs> Anyhow, that was, and then the headmistress there was a Mrs. Olsen, who helped me in my spiritual life, gave me a Bible to read and had me doing morning service at the school. Those are, that was the most interesting and fascinating job I ever had, and I owe a lot of her, to her for giving me that opportunity. And then I entered the university in 1957, at the age of 17. And I was lucky. My father wanted me to do medicine, and I refused. In fact, he asked me what I wanted to be in life, and I said I wanted to be a chef. And he asked me if I was mad. I was going to be a doctor or a lawyer. So I struck those two things off my list. Studied botany, zoology, and chemistry at Rumors, based on the Shell scholarship which I had. In the summer holidays, I worked at Shell, and I used to pay me some, some good money for the holiday work there. And following my graduation, I joined Shell immediately after that and joined in the chemicals department where I rose to chemicals manager. In 1976, I was appointed general manager of Shell, the youngest and only Jamaican ever to be appointed to that position. And 
I think I did a great job there. I built up Jamaican shell enterprise and the Caribbean involved, got involved in the management of the Caribbean shell establishments also and built up Shell Jamaica to be the top shell corporation in the Caribbean. So I had some successes there which remain part of my legacy in the corporate world. In fact, I then became a president in the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce and the government recognized my contribution to the business community by awarding me a national honor, the Order of, order, the order of Distinction Commander Class. And <clears throat> I got involved also with the Sports Development Foundation, which the, minister, the Prime Minister then, Michael Manley, asked me to set up a funding program for sports. And I explained to him what I'd seen in Australia with respect to his lottery operation, which funded the building of the, of the Opera House in Sydney and various other things. And he said to me, cowboy, go ahead and do it. Then I said to him, but, but boss, you have already established that you're going to ban lotteries. He said, no, I had banned lotteries from being operated by the government, but I didn't ban lotteries from being operated by the private sector. So go ahead and set up a funding for sports. That had its level of, 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 of controversy, as you know, and you can remember back in 1991. But today, I glory in the effect that that sports development fund has had in terms of branding Jamaica as one of the leading sports countries in the world, especially in track and field. Mm -hmm. The fund was responsible for sending the reggae boys to, to play in the World Cup, historical. We paid the, the coaching fees for the coach then Simois, and that remains part of my legacy in sports, although my contribution there has never been recognized. You know, Carl, I've never been invited once to the sportsman and per sportsman year function put on by RGR. Never once been recognized for the contribution I've made to the development of sports through that sports development fund, which still remains the hallmark and the watershed of sports development in Jamaica today. And people can attest to that in terms of how we've been you mentioned, in Jamaica. You mentioned your time at Shell. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything to do with the then now defunct Shell Shield? That was part of my legacy at Shell. We had a general manager from Australia who was fantastic about cricket and had an interest therein. And I went to him and said, look, we need to develop a inter-territorial tournament that can build our cricketers and put us on the map in terms of development of cricket. And that was the genesis of the Shell Shield program. When he, when he left Shell, I took it over and built it up to what you know was one of the most successful intercontinental programs, fortunately. I was transferred to the Bahamas in 1983 and the general manager who took over from me did not have the same passion for the Shell Shield and it was Franz Botek, the late Franz Botek then, who transferred his sponsorship to Denton Geddes. Well, <coughs> that program still remains a legacy for the development of West Indies cricket, as you now realise and yeah. appreciate. Unfortunately, we never had a program against this, so like that again ever. And of course, Cricket West Indies is no longer where it used Usually. to be. Okay, back to horse racing now. Mm -hmm. You had your early initiation at Nutsford Park. What was racing like? Because that was a, that was a grass track. Correct. Uh, what was racing, racing like? Racing over there, we had a lot of English jockeys coming out here. We had a lot of English trainers, Abbey Granham, and a number of other trainers which were English based who came out here during the plantocracy days mm -hmm. and it built up racing then and we subsequently moved the racetrack from Nutsworth Park to Caymanus Park. That, that was 1959. 1959. What was that shift like? Well we moved from grass racing to, to, turf, to sand racing mm -hmm. which created a different kind of, 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 horse, of horses and Although we were importing horses from England and we started importing horses mainly from the States and our racing program has been developed mainly now with horses coming in from the States which are bred for speed more than for stamina mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and hence 
the Liberian Revolution has developed from there. Okay. You were also, before I get into the nitty gritty of some of the horses that you owned, some of the great moments that you have had on the track, what was, you were also, you also chaired the promoting company and several different, under different names, Racing Promotions, <laughs> Cayman as Track Limited. What happened? Well, you realize then Eddie Lai Corporation took over company from, the promoting company from then because of the problems they were having. And he, in fact, increased those problems where he couldn't pay purses regularly. And the government decided to take over the racetrack from them on the, on the uh, program for the involvement of the racing, racing people, the jockeys, the grooms and whatnot. And a share, share program was established where all of them were allocated shares. The jockey club was allocated three, years, three shares. The breeders, the owners, the, the, the trainers, the grooms, the jockeys, all of them were allocated shares. And that's the formation of Racing Promotions Limited. That was chaired at the beginning by Maya Macklin, the late Maya Macklin. And we had a problem then because the bookmakers were controlling about 80% of the sales, which we had to lobby the government to introduce a special tax on the bookmakers to assist us with purse payments then. So from those days we were having problems with purses. They established a betting levy scheme which was operated by the Racing Commission. And I used to get it every month, additionals to purses. Unfortunately that funding went through the Consolidated Fund which took forever to come to racing promotions. And we incurred a lot of interest charges at the bank for the overdraft which we had to pay because we had to pay the purse established each month by them. That was subsequently changed when Don Chensey became chairman of of, of, of Caymanas Track Limited and there's a transition from Racing Promotions Limited. Racing Promotions Limited was declared bankrupt by the government headed by Edward Siaga then. And I remember we had tried to put in a new tote machine back in 1984, which we had leased on a lease agreement and the bank, National Commercial Bank had agreed to fund the leasing program. And the then government refused to allow us to do that because they claimed it would be a drain on their national, national or, or foreign exchange. Seymour Mullins was Minister of Finance that we eventually got the funding to put in a new tote machine, which created a major difference in terms of the betting handle and whatnot. The company was changed from Racing Promotion Limited, which I was chairman of, and gave, and, and had, when I, when I was transferred to the Bahamas, I resigned as president then, and it was taken over by, I'm not quite sure who, but the government became more involved in it. I've been declared as bankrupt under the chairmanship of Dennis Leila, then was chairman of the Racing Commission. What would you say were your successes and your failures working with and at times heading the promoting company to what we have now? One of the important things we did was to <coughs> establish a revolving loan fund which Racing Promotions put a sum of money into. And that revolving loan fund was to assist prospective owners to buy horses was payment over an 18 months period. That program is still in existence today, not funded by the promoting company anymore, but funded thankfully by the government through the Racing Commission and by the thoroughbred owners and operated by them. The other legacy areas I can think of, we got the government to institute a full subsidy program, which is still in existence today, which provides some subsidy to breeders for producing foals. We have also recently got the government to assist us in bringing in new horses for racing and establish a stimulus package. We have just brought in some horses from Canada. We had some serious problems with the importation of those horses based on some misunderstanding with the veterinary division, which somehow has been resolved. The horses have all been sold now. And that stimulus package, unfortunately, we are not able to do it again this year because the payment program for those horses 
has not allowed us to get the revolving fund back into place for purchasing new houses. So we're going to suspend the approval until next year. Okay. In part one of the lifetime narrative of Howard Hamilton, we ventured through his early days in racing, his corporate endeavors, and his time as the head of various horse racing promoting companies. In part two, to come, Quick Gallop, jhay.com, and its YouTube channel. The Quick Galloper, Traverse Hamilton's successes on the racetrack, his time as head of the Breeders' Association, and also his endearing legacy on the sport of horse racing. Join us shortly for part two. Thank you for watching another video produced by the team from quickgallopjaya.com and its YouTube channel, The Quick Galloper. Please stay on the channel for other enlightening videos on those involved in local horse racing. Please like, subscribe, and press the notification bell.